Didn't Napoleon do that? He absolutely did. You're right. That's a very good historical perspective on the matter. Sorry, Sam, I, I got off on a tangent. Uh, I'm, I'm here to talk about these things. I thought, thought. You, I thought that's what you were here for. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. I, I had, I had a bullet. This, let's get through had this. had a bullet list of really topics. And, so talk you know. about this. <laughs> let's let's yeah, get I've, through this rotary stuff so we can talk about this. <laughs> yeah, I apologize <laughs> for jumping in. No, 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 no. We want to hear this from no your problem. perspective. I mean, I have my Absolutely. perspective from having lived and worked for, at Radio Free Europe in Prague. And and knowing the Russians, I knew, but that's a long. It was a while ago, and but he's always he's always scared the bejesus out of me. Well, let's even let's in the ahead, early days. Yeah, let's go ahead and begin. Um, so let's let's go ahead and kick this meeting off. <clears throat> Thank you for everyone who's here. Uh, we do have a um, exceptional speaker in store, uh, but we'll go ahead and and get started. Uh, here's our bell. All right, and we do have uh, a couple of guests. Before we introduce our guest, uh, anyone who's not a Rotarian, let me just explain to you how this works. Um, in Rotary, we have basically four basic tenets, four foundational beliefs, four things that we that we think, say, and do, no matter where you are in the world. So, what I'll ask is, any Rotarian, if you would, uh, unmute yourself, and you can just say it with me. I'll keep cadence with clicking, but you've probably done this a thousand times before. Some of you, maybe a million. Uh, when we get to to Chuck, you might be up in the millions. We'll see here, but. Um, uh, if you if you need to know what the words are, uh, Tim or, or any other guest, I'll click with you. So every Rotarian, if you would, unmute your mic and of the four-way test of the things we think, say, and do. Is it the is truth? It the truth? truth? Is it, is it fair to all, all concerns? concerns? To all concerns. Is it fun? Is it fun? Yeah, Heck yeah. We have that Heck one yeah. too. <laughs> one, one. Secret handshake too. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we got uh, we got a couple of uh, a couple of distinguished uh, guests and visitors here. Let me uh, let me save uh, Tim, our speaker, for the end. But I do see a couple of visitors. I got a, a note uh, just yesterday. Perfect timing. Uh, Chuck, could you introduce yourself? I am so excited that you're here. Could you tell us a little bit about your your history? Or did Chuck drop off? Oh, there, there's Chuck. I see you. Yeah, I'm uh, Chuck Sawicki. Uh, uh, I uh, live in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania during Florida hurricane season in Palm Beach Gardens, uh, Florida uh, during, the, during the wintertime. Uh, I've been a Rotarian for 57 years as a member of 12 clubs. Uh, I uh, uh, was fortunate in uh, my father being a Rotarian. Uh, every promotion I've gotten or move I've gotten, I've lived in all, I've, I've visited or lived in all 50 states and over 100 countries. In fact, uh, I mentioned to you uh, almost 20 years ago, visiting with at the, at the uh, uh, Krakow Rotary Club, a uh, guy uh, pulled me aside and, uh, and, and after the meeting said, you're mispronouncing your name, but that's more important. Uh, you're... Uh, <laughs> Uh, you got to go back to tell all your friends, uh, despite putting us under the Germans and the Russians, uh, over all your politicians, the best friends you have in Europe are the Poles. And that's kind of stuck with me with the, what uh, the number of people that they're taking on to take care of. Uh, and the reason that I've, I've been in Rotary for all those years is the networking, the program learning and service opportunities. And it's nice being part of a small non I mean, uh, being a small part of a large organization that makes a big difference in the world uh, and, in, and in their local community. So uh, I'm just um, anxious to know more about, I'm a, I've been a member of District 6930 for a long time, uh, but uh, I'm getting older and it, that Palm Beach County traffic is pretty brutal. <laughs> We're we're so happy to have you here, Chuck. Uh, welcome. You're always absolutely welcome. Please join anytime. Um, and I think you brought a couple of friends, Chuck. I, I see a couple other folks on the call. Uh, Bruce, do you want to say hello? You You're muted, might be Bruce. Muted. <laughs> You're muted, Bruce. He he. Now I see Bruce is on an iPhone. So Bruce, that's okay if if you're having trouble finding the unmute button. Take your time. Oh, I got there. it. There you go. There okay. it is. Now, yeah. yes, sir. Okay, hi, and hello to everyone. Jula, I thank you so much for letting me know, even though it was last minute, about today's uh, podcast or 
broadcast or whatever this is called, I, I'm really looking forward to it. Even just the preliminaries were just so fascinating to hear this information. Um, I'm from the Rotary Club downtown Boca Raton. Uh, we recently held, had a uh, fundraising effort called Putt for Peace, where we had miniature golf, um, where we were charged $15 by the miniature golf people uh, per person, but we charged $100 to each of our members and other attendees and all the proceeds, which was over $7,000, we're uh, sending to a district in Ukraine, the frontline humanitarian relief people. So uh, I, I feel very much invested and very much interested in what's going to be said today. And thank you so much for recognizing me. Appreciate Thanks, Bruce. it. Thank you for coming, Bruce. I, I also see Ron. Ron, do you want to say hello? Uh, yes. Hello, Julia. I made it. Um, <laughs> Julia is uh, one of my classmates as a governor, and I'm from the Dr. Phillips Rotary Club in Orlando, Florida, although I'm in Colorado right now. And um, I say my, my Rotary spouse, my wife, is well aware of that. Um, <laughs> I'm happily Julia's Rotary spouse most of the time, but as we all know, she can be a pain in the behind sometimes as well. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> you, yes, you. <laughs> Anyhow, I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for letting me know, Julia. Thanks, Ron. Thanks for joining. All right. Uh, let me just take a quick look around. If anybody else is a guest, hide behind a camera, please unmute yourself. Elaine, do you want to? And You're, we can hear you. I, we can hear you. Okay. I can't turn my TV, my camera on. Let me see if I can do that. I guess I can't. No um, I'm, uh, thank you, Julia, for inviting me to this. It's very nice of you to do that. Um, I am the, uh, district assistant governor coordinator and, uh, I'm just happy to be here and I thank you. Thank you for joining us. All right. Well, with that, uh, Ron, we will turn it over to our other Coloradan, uh, Ed. Do you want to do you want to take over with our uh, our Sergeant Arms Happy Bucks announcements and things? Yeah, let's uh, let's do a quick one so we can get to our speaker. Um, th there was a suggestion for fines. I, I don't know. Maybe I should take this. <laughs> um, if you're not in the um, in the path of the hurricane, you uh, will assess a fine. So. <laughs> How much? My, my home is in the path of the hurricane. I, I don't know about the rest, but how much? That, your call. We'll, we'll let everybody assess their own fines. You, you want to know what shape your house is in at this moment? <laughs> what about the stove in the? What about the stove in the driveway? It was gone. The, the stove, <laughs> we, we finally got that out. It should be all boarded up. We, we should be in good shape. Now my shutters are up. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. Do we have any um, birthdays, anniversaries? Okay, uh, let's move on to, uh, let, let's always, let's start with sad dollars anyway. Any sad dollars? I'll do a sad hurricane dollar. <laughs> yeah, me too. I'm, 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 I'm worried about all my friends and family in Florida. Y'all stay safe down there. Thank you. Thank you. Alice has her hand up. Ed, if you can't see it. Oh, there it is. Okay, Ailish. Yeah, thank you, Susie. Hey, Ed. Uh, I was our daughter because I put a post on, I put a post on LinkedIn uh, in relation to the NASA, the NASA um, uh, being able to hit the asteroid, and that was just the most remarkable thing to me. Uh, so I just put a post with a link to it. And I said, <clears throat> I'm so, I'm so proud of my country. And six people, I'm Irish, for those who don't know, six people from Ireland came in and said, I thought you were Irish. What are you talking about? It's like, Jesus, you know, can you not be both? <laughs> God. I just don't know which country you meant. Yeah, I know. Just, they knew. They knew. They were just, I mean, one one particular, they were all being kind of, you know, they were, they were all really tongue in cheek. But there was one who was not tongue in cheek. So I phoned him up and I said, what the heck are you talking about? So I, this is where I've lived for 25 years. Stop. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Susie. 
I have a mixed emotion dollar, so maybe we can move into happy, sad from or to happy from here. Um, a mixed emotion is I was supposed to leave. I was in my dad's for four nights visiting him in Georgia. Flew home last night. Was supposed to leave tomorrow at noon and drive to St. Pete to teach a leadership class. Turn around Friday, drive to Orlando and fly to England until the sixth to go over there to have lunch with some friends and some other things, and then fly back on the sixth. And then get up in the morning on the 7th and go to Alana's, our fellow member, Alana Alicia's daughter's wedding on the 7th, 8th and 9th. I'm still going to be able to, I think, do the UK to Richmond part of the trip, but I'm not having to drive into St. Pete for the um, for the hurricane. So that's kind of a mixed emotion because I have fun teaching it, but I'm glad I don't have to do that. So mixed emotion. <clears throat> I will jump on that with you, Susie, because um, I, I was supposed to go to the continuing education or <laughs> as well. So, yeah, I was going to see Jen this this last part of this week too. So in person. So, yeah. Sound okay. a bit sniffy, Susie. Are you okay? Yeah, I caught a cold up at my dad's. It's not COVID. Oh. I tested. It's I'm fine. I just have a head cold. <clears throat> well, I, I have a sad dollar that Susie doesn't feel good. <laughs> at least i don't look i i didn't you didn't say i didn't look good so you look great oh, would never. <laughs> you look fabulous you oh, look thanks. like you feel fantastic oh thanks no I, i'm i'm fine but thank you let's see any others i've got a i guess another a mixed emotion uh dollar we uh we hit the road back to florida on friday um whoops oh yep. Five dollars for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Grass Valley, California. I know nobody from there. But um, yeah, so we'll be keeping an eye on the weather because uh, Ian will probably be right in Georgia when we uh, start getting to Georgia. So we'll, we'll have to. Yeah, you might want to sure. rethink your route. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the Florida Panhandle instead. So we'll see. But um, all right, do we have any? Um, Let's see, any happy dollars? I have a happy dollar. Oh. This is Kimberly. I'm, 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 finally back in the, I'm finally back teaching live and, and I have a new class of interns at the VA Academy and, and I just, I couldn't be happier being in the classroom with them. I just spent the last two weeks with them and, and uh, it, was, it was great seeing their smiley little faces in person. I've missed them so much. Well, that's awesome. All right, uh, let's see. Uh, Michael and Denise have their hand up. George, I think has, he's at the top of my screen, so I'm just going from top to oh, bottom. Too. <laughs> my turn? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, I, actually, I had this sad dollar, uh, but I couldn't figure out how to raise my hand. <laughs> but anyway, the sad dollar is that when Irma came and hit us, Hurricane Irma in 2017, I lost about eight screens on my, uh, I got a pool that I use for exercise and the screen and the screens went out. And uh, in Florida, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the rate, the, the deductible is $3,500. Uh, for hurricane damage, and uh, so I, and it was that way then, and uh, now it looks like I'm going to be spending more uh, if we get hit, and it looks like we're going to get hit tomorrow. Uh, so I'm not real thrilled about that. I might be spending two thousand, three thousand out of my pocket because I can't make the deductible. Uh, George, crazy. the secret is cut the screen. I'm cut sorry, the what? screen. Cut your screen. So it don't uh, damage the enclosure. I, I I'm almost deaf too, so I'm sorry I can't understand what you're saying. I'll email you. What's that? <laughs> I was going to ask Mike. Mike, did, are you uh, are you uh, going to evacuate the beach side? You're still on the beach side, right? Actually, my most of my shutters are up, and uh, less than uh, thirty minutes ago, I canceled. Uh, two nights at the Hampton Inn starting tomorrow because, for one thing, they don't have generators. The Hilton Rialto has generators, but they're booked. And so we decided to stick it out in our neighborhood because uh, all of our neighbors here that are here uh, are sticking it out. 
isn't it a mandatory evacuation? No. 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 Okay. Good for you. Not in Brevard. But only on the west coast. But speaking of Irma, Irma, we were living uh, in the town of Melbourne Beach at the time, or close, and it got within about a half inch of uh, flooding. And uh, so I started draining water out of my pool out to the street, sort of, so that the raining water would drain back toward the pool, and not into my house. All right, well, let's keep, uh, not to be too hardcore about this, but let's try and keep this moving if we can. We've got an excellent speaker that I'm sure we're all anxious to hear. Um, Mike, you're a uh, happy dog? I have an anticipatory I, I could say that a post stroke anticipatory dollar for uh, Aaron Judge, apparently <laughs> being the first legitimate person to surpass Roger Maris for the uh, single season uh, home run record. I, apparently legitimate. I, I hope he's not shown <laughs> to be a doper. That's I'm an old baseball fan. That's important. I thank you, Denise. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I'm happy because um, tomorrow morning I will be getting my fourth COVID vaccination, which is actually going to be a new vaccine, which also includes the uh, um, Omicron variants and everything. So I'm very happy about that. Awesome. Congrats. Way to go. Uh, Ailish? I have, I, have, I have an information dollar. My daughter, Alana, is there. She's online, but she's in and out with phone calls today. So she's hoping to catch as much as she can. Um, there you have it. Okay. Great. All right. Well, I'm going to turn this over to Sam. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Really appreciate that. Today, we do have a, a, a speaker who's, who's uh, special to me. Uh, Tim is a dear friend of mine. Uh, work together with Tim, and, and Tim is actually coming to us live from China, so he's going to hang this call up at what, 1 a.m., Tim? You know what? <laughs> I may be from Pensacola. I'm not even sure if I qualify for this. I have a panhandle dollar. Does that count? There you go. <laughs> is that the old, the old like, before the Di Dixies? Yeah, I'm technically almost from Alabama, so I don't even know if I'm supposed to be here. Wasn't <laughs> I supposed to talk to the Alabama Rotary Club? Did I get my wires crossed? <laughs> Uh, Tim, as you can tell, Tim is an amateur comedian, but, uh, <laughs> but the reason we're having him here, <laughs> you can find Tim, uh, you can find Tim all over the place. He's all over the world. Um, this is Tim's, uh, Twitter page, uh, 30,000 strong, Tim, you have really outdone yourself, man. Um, Tim is, is again, uh, a dear friend of mine. We met together working as, uh, as educators in China. Um, Tim is going to talk to us today, not about education in China, uh, but perhaps a little bit about about uh, human trafficking in China, but we'll that'll be a peripheral topic. We'll we'll try to stick mm. to Ukraine. Uh, but Tim is is joining to tell us about what's going on in Ukraine. He's been there and he's going back uh, very soon. He can give you all the dates. Um, we're just really really happy to to have you, Tim. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining. I'm gonna hit stop share and turn it over to you, buddy. Thanks, Sam. Um... You know what? It, it may be midnight here, but uh, it's refreshing to connect with fellow Floridians. It's uh, it's been a while, so uh, I'm happy to see you all in such an active, engaged community. So well informed. Again, I don't know if people from as close to Alabama as I'm from are eligible, but uh, we're going to pretend I'm a real Floridian and not from far up on the Panhandle. So. Um, I'm not sure where to start, folks. It's a complicated story. I am a, uh, a special education teacher, also a professor, um, and uh, also a right leg amputee. So you may immediately be saying to yourself, this man doesn't look like a very good recruiting poster for people to go to Ukraine and help. He's not even able-bodied. No, you're darn right. My body is held together with duct tape and wire and... Yeah. So uh, Sam and I met a number of years ago while Sam was serving as a director of technology in China, doing an amazing job, an amazing steward for our community and uh, was just a joy. I even recorded a song for Sam when he left, which uh, I think if you give him enough dollars, he may actually share with you at one point. Uh, thank you, Kimberly. Uh, so 
I uh, I want to be very clear about this. Um, this is a social media war. And a lot of the coverage that you see of the Ukrainian conflict and the people that you saw that were involved, uh, as far as volunteers go, are people who saw about the conflict on Facebook or Twitter and booked a flight to Warsaw. Uh, when I landed, the airport was full of them. And we'll, we'll talk about that. But I, I want to be very clear from the start. I didn't show up at the border and ask for a gun. I didn't go on my own. I was invited by the Ukrainian government to go. I was given a green light at the very highest levels of their military and government to come assist them with the crisis. And we'll talk about that. It's one of the reasons I was in China and met Sam. Um, so I was born disabled and um, I've been disabled my entire life uh, in pretty significant pain. But I think suffering is a universal common denominator among humans. And it's something that binds us as a shared understanding of suffering. None of us are young. I'm 47. I know that's laughable to some of you, but believe me, I feel every year of it. And uh, I was in an environment up until very recently where the people I was coaching and talking to were average ages 18 to 24. So I, uh, they called me Uncle Tim, and there was a very good reason for that. So um, I am not a career teacher. My background is in criminal justice. I've spent most of my adult life, fight, life fighting human trafficking overseas. Um, it's still, sadly, something that happens within our own borders. But I've spent the majority of my adult life overseas. It is an epidemic in Asia. It is uh, very briefly something that's still condoned by a lot of governments here, as Sam is aware. They consider it a family matter. And we are told not to intervene, not to assist in any way, because we're told that we are disrupting local law, culture, custom, and family matters. So oftentimes, those of us in Asia that work against human trafficking do so with zero support. And we are actually frequently uh, harassed and countered by local area governments who don't want us involved in any way, shape, or form. Sam has links to one of the organizations that I work with, which I'm sure he can share with you. Uh, we work multinationally, but uh, let's get on to Ukraine. That is uh, surprisingly what led me to Ukraine. Um, when the conflict started, I had a really hard time sitting back and watching it. I'm sure many of you have. It's difficult to watch and the scenes were terrifying. The assault on decency, humanitarian values and a lot of the progress that we as a people, a world people have made over the last 100 years, uh, the very jeopardy of the world order seemed threatened. And, and, and those of you that are a little older than me, I was raised by my grandparents. My, my grandfather, uh, I never met my father, but my grandfather raised me and he helped liberate a concentration camp. And the images struck that man until the day that he died. And he raised me to believe that as you've heard it before, this improperly quoted quote to um, one of our great philosophers, all evil needs to flourish is for good men to stand by and do nothing. I was not raised to believe in standing by and doing nothing, even though I stand on, well, one leg, like a lovely bearded flamingo. So um, when it started, when the conflict started, I had dealt with some trafficking issues with Ukrainian refugees throughout the last several years. Uh, sadly, they are a very vulnerable population because as you very well-informed Rotarians know, this conflict it dates back to 2014 and before. There are incredible books dedicated to the lengthy history of this conflict. Just the current version dates to 2014. Some of these young men, it's all that they've known most of their lives. And um, it was it's nothing new to them. A lot of my young soldiers grew up in this war. When, um, they, again, they are historically disenfranchised people and a very vulnerable population. I had uh, met some individuals from the Ukrainian embassy previously through my work. And when the conflict started, I reached out to them and I said, uh, um, I realize uh, um, human trafficking, you may or may not know, is increasingly being considered 
as a crime against humanity by the International Criminal Court. Um, we hope that it is something that they choose to take uh, fully under their wing as far as investigations go. But in the recent, in the last five years, I've had to become very familiar with the International Criminal Court and preparation for them to hopefully get involved in more of the widespread trafficking concerns. And when we talk about this, we're talking about human trafficking that is condoned and in some cases encouraged by national governments in, in Asia. So um, as we prepare, hopefully, for ICC involvement in, and their jurisdiction in some of these crimes, uh, the Ukrainians contacted me uh, back and said they knew who I was. And they said, you have a familiarity with the International Criminal Court, crimes against humanity. They said, are you comfortable getting involved in war crimes? I said, well, you know, uh, I'm happy to help in any way that I can. Can you give me more information? And they said, uh, this is, I have video of this that I've sent to Sam. Um, they said, our very way of living is threatened. They seek to extinguish our culture. We are looking for people who are willing to help us in any way they can. But what we desperately need is not simply people to come over and grab a gun, which they still needed as per Zelensky's call. But they needed people that were familiar with investigating the sorts of crimes that the International Criminal Court handles, crimes against humanity, war crimes. And as they sought to build their case, they found that they were absolutely inundated and overwhelmed due to the nature of this being an artillery war. With um, It's hard to talk to you about because I have 16 gigabytes of crimes that I am currently still helping them investigate in front of me. And I say this from uh, coming back to see my daughter and family. I'm still working for the Ukrainians right now. Uh, it's hard things to look at. They give me nightmares. And when they showed me what was happening in the country and they asked me to get involved to potentially help with the investigation of these war crimes, we had a very simple agreement, folks. And Sam knows this. Our agreement was, Tim, we would like you to come here, bring your metal leg. Well, all right. We think you would inspire people. We want people to see that an American war crimes investigator has come here to help us. You don't need to go anywhere near the combat, which, as those of you who are familiar with this type of warfare um, may well know, there is nowhere that is not near the combat in modern warfare with cruise missiles and artillery. They said, come to Kiev, do some training, help us go out in the field, investigate, and um, we will absolutely um, be grateful for the rest of our lives if you could just come and help us. So <laughs> one-legged, held together with duct tape. I took a sabbatical from teaching and I answered their call. I did not just answer their call. I did some very high level assistance of the Ukrainian government as favors. I brought life-saving equipment to them through several countries. Uh, in May, when I first arrived in Ukraine, they were out of everything. They had no equipment for their soldiers, no uniforms. Um, I transited through Poland and Dubai. Talking about those Poles and their support, some of the most incredible people I've met in my life, the Poles. Um, I, I can't even begin to tell you, Warsaw is a truly bilingual city now. They have sheltered and taken in so many Ukrainian refugees and those people, I want you to know that Polish people insisted on not letting me take a train to Ukraine. They insisted on driving me all the way to the border under blackout wartime conditions in their cars. We had a convoy of four cars escorting me and all the equipment I brought for the soldiers to the Ukrainian border at 1 a.m. Th those are the kind of people that we talk about when we talk about the Poles and their unwavering support of, of freedom. Uh, I was a little shocked when I found out that they refer to Warsaw as Little Texas. Uh, but they are uh, just magical people, and they keep asking me to go back and teach, and I may well do that. But my obligation to Ukraine stands first. So uh, I'll move on here. I arrived in Ukraine with every intention of going to the capital 
sitting in an office, going out in the field with their police teams and investigating war crimes, and that is not what happened at all. Um, I arrived in the middle of the night, and the very first night that I was in Ukraine, the very first train station I was at full of women and children was hit with cruise missiles. Um, I had been in Ukraine a matter of hours, and I found myself uh, desperately trying to get women and children into cover. Um, as cruise missiles came down on Lviv, the border city with Poland. That was my introduction to this conflict, the uh, widespread attempt of extermination of the Ukrainian way of life, the terror tactics used against their people. Um, I will tell you very bluntly, a lot of the early volunteers that went to Ukraine stayed about a day and left. Um, you, you have, I'm sure you've all heard that the military, the staging base near the border was hit uh, we lost over 83 people in that attack. Most of the foreign volunteers left at that point, and that was literally the week that I came. Um, people, even even our veterans, and God bless our veterans, uh, I, I served with a lot of uh, of our veterans there, and even those that had fought in Iraq and Afghanistan said, we were in no way prepared for warfare on this scale. We're used to fighting insurgents not cruise missiles, not tank columns. It was something that most people absolutely could not have prepared for. But we also could not have prepared for the absolute ineptitude and failure of Russian high command, which we'll, we'll get into uh, further. At any rate, I went there to investigate war crimes. I was bombed from the day that I arrived. The day I arrived to Kiev to meet with their police, we were bombed there too. And... They said, Tim, most of the war crimes that are being investigated that we really need help with right now are at the front lines. They are in places like Kharkiv. We need you to go there. I have been in combat before. I have been in war zones before. I am not a man that runs for, well, I'm not a man that runs. Let's put it that way. Okay, this, this leg, it, it was made in China. I can barely walk on it. So let me be very clear. I deployed to Ukraine in crippling pain agony, barely able to walk. And I was very clear with them about this. And they still asked me to come because they knew that I wasn't going to run when the bombs started falling. And I did not. The picture that Sam is sharing, so you know, I took in a city called Sumy, in Sumy Oblast, or province of Ukraine. Off in the distance um, is the Russian border. That is how close I spent most of my time in Ukraine was to uh, to Russia. I will also tell you that I am on the Ministry of Fine of Foreign Affairs in Russia's uh, naughty list. I wasn't planning on going to Russia soon. It appears I never can. Um, I didn't make any friends there during my trip, unfortunately. So I was asked to go to the front lines or very near the front lines in Ukraine, and so I did. I was embedded with a Ukrainian Territorial Defense Force unit of men aged 18 to 60. These men are similar to, this is the unit, the picture that Sam's showing you. There's me and my horrible uh, Kevlar helmet uh, haircut. <laughs> um, these are the Territorial Defense Forces. If you look closely, you can see very young men, and you can see another man, Yevgeny, in the picture, who is 61 years old and answered the call. He answered the call same as I did, and um, they actually had me film a recruiting video for the Ukrainians while I was there with the, with the central message of, if I can be here fighting and helping and risking my life with one leg, why can't you help Ukraine with two? You have to admit it's an effective message. <laughs> I have stood where the armor columns collapsed in Bucha and Irpin, the Russian spearhead into Kiev. There are pictures of me on those tanks. I have met with the residents. I have aided and held the children. The poor children refugees are having to still hide in the forest there because they keep bombing their refugee camps. There is a hidden encampment of thousands of children in the woods near those towns because those children are still afraid to go to their homes. I took them food, donations. They live in the woods like hermits just because the Russians can still reach them. They'll live the rest of their lives 
knowing the terror that was inflicted on them, seeing their parents die in front of them in bombardments. I, I have been with foreign reporters into the torture cellars where they held, murdered, raped, beat Ukrainian citizens. Um, without delving into the issue of trans rights, I will tell you, one of the reporters that I worked with was transgender in Ukraine, an American reporter who was there to investigate what had been uncovered as the systematic murder of gay and lesbian Ukrainians who had been targeted in the towns that the Russians overran, uh, who still lives in the city of Kharkiv and is still reporting from there today and was there from the start of the war, months before even I arrived. So one-legged, 47, not anybody's uh, patriotic recruiting poster, but they called and I answered the call as an American who believes in defending democracy, who was raised by a man who warned me as a World War II veteran that those times would come again and that we could not stand idly by. We knew immediately that this would not stop with Ukraine, and it's been proven that there was no intention for this to stop with Ukraine. So um, moving on. I have had to dodge landmines. I have been under heavy bombardment, constant attack. But what I have gone through pales in comparison to what the average Ukrainian civilian has suffered through. I want you to think about this, folks. These people don't have the luxury. Uh, I medically had to leave Ukraine to go have surgery in Seattle on my amputation site. I almost had to have my knee amputated up to the pelvic bone because of injuries that got much worse serving in Ukraine, silver dollar sized hole in the back of my leg. I couldn't even wear my prosthetic. Um, these people can't even leave the country to get medical care. I could. They are trapped. Very, very many of them, particularly the men still can't leave. That's what a hero is. I was happy to go and help these people. And people have used the hero word for me a few times. I can't stand it. There are people so much braver than me that have to get up, take their kids to school, function, work in this war zone. People that are suffering and defenseless. I went there in heavy body armor, as Sam has seen, heavily armed. I was able to defend myself at all times. I was armed with an AK-74 the majority of my trip. Um, there's not a lot you can do to defend yourself against artillery attacks, as we all know, but um, I helped these men learn how to survive in urban warfare, combat conditions. And um, I'm going to tell you something unpopular today. There are victims on both sides. I had the luck and the blessing of working with men on the Russian border who have families in both countries. It was a very porous border before things got really hostile. The majority of the inhabitants there speak Russian, not Ukrainian. The majority of the signs, well, before they got torn down, and understandably so, were in Russian. Um, it's, it's a culture that is interchangeable in many places in these border cities, particularly in a religious manner. So please understand, um, these, these people have suffered unimaginable things, but they have also suffered the separation of, of family. Uh, the Russian soldiers that I saw, the people that I met, I met so many stranded Russian families in Dubai just flying into Ukraine who were not allowed to transit through countries to get home anymore, who had lost all their money, their bank accounts were gone, De uh, their, their currency invalid, who didn't know what they were going to do, nothing to return to. There are victims on both sides. I have seen war crimes all over the map while I was there. This is a, this is not a black and white conflict, I want to say to you. It is shades of gray. I absolutely support the Ukrainian people, but I want you to know these, the average Russian soldier and conscript, they didn't even know they were going to Ukraine. These poor young men were told they were going on maneuvers. They're using World War II era Soviet commissars pointing guns at the back of these young men's heads and telling them that if they don't fight, they'll die. As in shot, I have seen pictures, I have them in front of me here, 
of young Russian men shot in the back of the head by their own officers for refusing to charge at Ukrainian tanks under fire. The, these men, and you've, I'm sure you've all seen the video in the last couple of days, are being rounded up from universities, gas stations, their students, activists, IT specialists, bakers, and herded to the front lines with no training. They're already, my men have already contacted me yesterday and said they're starting to take prisoners from these men. These men are begging in mass to surrender. If you can believe that entire units are already surrendering and the Ukrainians barely have the capacity at this point to feed themselves, even with all the aid they've given. And they're having to take care of numbers. I'm privy to the numbers of Russian captives that are being held. They would stagger, stagger all belief. They're surrendering by division at this point as the war turns and the Ukrainians start to push south. So I can talk to you about a number of things. I can tell you about the work that I've done with Ukrainian intelligence to capture Russian and Iranian drones, to create a network of drone sensors, to take them down, to reverse engineer them, to try to stop them being used to guide long-range attacks in Ukraine. I can tell you about the war crimes specifically visited upon the gay and lesbian population. I can tell you, having been firsthand in the sites of indiscriminate bombing. But I will tell you the most frightening thing about this, and this is why the days ahead may be very dark. I have stood in the streets of Bucha and Irpin with the survivors. I have stood at the mass graves. They will haunt my dreams for the rest of my life. What, what I have seen. And I don't live there. I have stood in the tank graveyard where the Russians died in mass trying to take Kiev. Um, the thing is, folks, when the Russians invaded, a lot of these towns, they didn't touch them. They were pristine. It is when the Russians were on the run and trying to escape in a panic, underfed, underclothed, that they began to rape and murder and destroy. And that is what happened in Irpin and Bucha, according to their own residents. Nothing in the world is as dangerous as a hungry, impoverished, famished, demoralized, and terrified army on the run. And that is the situation that I can, I think you can all confirm seeing on the news. Um, these poor young men were sent to die, their cannon fodder, by their master strategist, as we were discussing uh, as the call started. I have never met a single Russian that wanted this war. You may, um, I'll, I'll get close to closing here. You may be tempted to ask me, Tim, you were there, you're going back, why are you going back? Because the job's not done. Because my men contact me every day and they have needs and I have the ability to help them, help lead them, guide them, and bring money back to help take care of these young men. My job's not done. And I wasn't raised to quit a job halfway through. I left because I medically had to. I want you to know the whole time I was in Ukraine, I was teaching my students remotely from trenches, <laughs> bomb shelters. Thank you, Elon Musk. And the entire time as an educator, part of the agreement I made with my school is when I left, I will still teach classes. I taught the entire time I was there in the field, in bunkers, in Kiev, on the front lines. Every chance I got to record, to do asynchronous learning with my classes of special education students, I did. So you may be very tempted to ask me why I'm going back, because we still have work to do. And after the war, you know what Ukraine's going to need? Teachers. Desperately. The Ukrainians uh, had their schools and churches specifically targeted for systematic destruction. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. Um, I'm not as knowledgeable as some people. I'm only one man. I wasn't particularly well suited for the conflict, but I went, I did not run, I did my duty. Other people are much better qualified than me, but they asked me to come and I answered the call. Even as an amputee, I, you'll see on my Twitter, I receive regular hate mail. You're useless, you're a cripple, you left. Yeah, I had to be medically forced to leave, and I wasn't going to put my men's lives at risk because I was hurt so badly I couldn't walk anymore. I was a liability. 
and I needed to go heal. And now that I'm healed, I'm going back. So Sam, anything else? I'm happy to take questions. Ask me anything you want without jeopardizing the lives of my men currently serving and fighting. That is a citation from the Army of Ukraine. This is one of the small groups of men that I helped serve. One of those gentlemen is 18 years old. On the right is my citation from the city of Sumy in Ukraine for helping to lead and train their troops. Now, you, you mentioned my men. Could you just elaborate on that? When, what, what do you mean by my men? I was uh, utilized by the Ukrainian army specifically as an advisor to the territorial defense. And so when you, they I happen to know you have a rank, what, what can you tell me about that? That when they, when they utilized me with the territorial defense, they gave me the rank of captain. Captain has always been a joke with me because I'm a pirate. I had six pirate <laughs> tattoos before I lost my leg. Okay. You can see me in the middle. Look for the fat American. I'm right there. I had six pirate tattoos before they cut my leg off. I'm from the Gulf Coast. What do you expect? Of course, I like pirates. I am one now. All I have to do is lose my eye and get a parrot. Um, I was, something, I, go ahead. Oh, no, something else I was going to ask you is I, you know, I, I really appreciate you being, um, being transparent and you didn't, you didn't shy away from a very unpopular thing to say, which is that there are atrocities on both sides and that sure. There are victims on mm -hmm. both sides. I guess I just want to say thank you for that, you know, for 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 telling the truth, because I think that's something that, you know, we, we don't want to hurt the war effort. And you and I talked about how we like how we have these conversations and what we say and what we what kind of we message do. we put out. And we have to be careful because we do Amen. want to be clear that this is something that we support. This is something we want to continue to support. Um, but like I said, uh, you know, we, we kind of made a promise to the folks who came on this call that you're going to kind of hear an unvarnished truth and observations from the front line. And sometimes those observations are not what the mainstream media will say. So uh, thank you. They're painful. You for that. Yeah, painful for realities, that. but that is the face of warfare. And let's bear in mind that this is not what we think modern warfare was going to be with drones and warplanes. This is World War I style trench warfare, folks. Disease kills as many people out there as the Russians do in many cases. So let me check chat here really quick. Let's see what we have queued up for questions. I'm happy to open the floor. I'll tell you anything I can without jeopardizing operational security. I'm going back. I don't want my life risked, but moreover than that, I don't want the life of my men risked. Very, very good question, Denise. The, the Ukrainian people are uh, incredibly bi and trilingual in many places as are the Polish people. I speak a smattering of Russian. A lot of it I had to learn while I was there. Around 30% of my soldiers, uh, the soldiers that are there, I, I take ownership for them. They're not mine. I was simply an advisor. But these men treated me as family and still do. I know their names. I know their wives. I know their children. They took me in. I've had borscht served by every family literally that I could across Ukraine. Everyone says theirs is the best, by the way. So I'm not really even sure what the best borscht is supposed to taste like, but I've had a hundred kinds. Um, we have, we have, we have a, a hand raised as well from, from Ailish, but um, you, could you tell us a little bit, you, you said that the, the people you're, the men you're traveling with something you told me that didn't come out in this talk was a comparison of what these troops are. So what are we talking about? Are we talking about like, you know, army? Are we talking about Marines? Are we talking about what are, what, what would you draw a comparison to for Americans maybe to, to understand? Army National Guard. Okay. These are part-time soldiers who were mobilized. Hmm. These men are IT professionals, cooks. They are fighting, however, in defense of their homes. So let's be very honest here, folks. Put yourself in their shoes. I want you to think about this for a sec. And Ailish, you're next. Um, what would you do? We, you know, as Floridians, we take our home security very seriously. We believe in standing our ground for the most part. If we were to have an armed invader or someone who is threatening our home, please understand, I didn't know any soldier there who hadn't lost someone or had someone raped or murdered or kidnapped or forcibly extradited to Russia to repopulate the Siberian region as, you know, in annexed properties. These men are fighting in defense of their very lives, their very nation, their democratic ideals. The, how hard would you fight in defense of your home 
if men with guns showed up. I just implore you to think about that. Put yourself in their shoes, regardless of your qualifications. Think about mine. I shouldn't have been there. Men like me should not have been called to serve, and especially not in a military capacity. But I went and I answered the call. What would you do if people came to your home or to your town and threatened you? Would you, regardless of age or infirmity, stand up? Would you consider it your democratic duty to protect free peoples in any way that you could, in any capacity that you had to the best of your ability? I can go to my death with the peace of knowing Let's be honest, I'm probably not going to live to be an old guy. I've got a lot of wounds, a lot of damage. I almost lost both legs. They managed to save one. I've had gangrene, sepsis. I was two hours away from death when they amputated my right leg. I have a limited life expectancy. So please understand from my perspective, I was given five years to live four years ago. I made a very deliberate decision in going, and it was not a death wish. It was if I only have one year left. What do I want my legacy to be? And this was my choice. Alice, you're on. Let's go. What would Thank you like you. to know? Come uh, talk to me. Uh, there has to be there. I, um, I'm interested in poetry. I'm a poet. But there has to be a poem that was written by men, uh, written about men like you in, in, in uh, 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 as the same as the same as this. I'm the same as Maya Angelou wrote Phenomenal Woman about, you Amazing know, about women. women. So there has to be one about phenomenal men like you. But having said that, my daughter can't, she's on a call at work, but she said, I'd love to know how to get involved as a war crimes and war crimes investigator. And believe me, she would be one of the best. She would well, probably I tell have you. to do it remotely because she works, works full time in Virginia. Of course. That's a great question. And that is the beauty of living in the digital age like we do. Anyone can investigate war crimes. I was specifically asked to go there because I have experience in combat zones. And they interviewed me for a month. They did a criminal background check on me. I'm a Floridian, so it was a gamble. <laughs> they did a criminal background check on me. They vetted me. They interviewed me six times and they kept saying the same thing. Tim, you're going to see people blown up. Are you sure you can handle this? And they specifically wanted me because I've served in combat zones as a civilian, as a civilian. And they, they knew, they even talked to people that I had been in combat zones with and said, will he run? Can he lead men? Can he do his job under fire? And I can. But that's the beauty of the modern age. You don't have to go there to help. In fact, they don't need more people coming to pick up guns, and they don't need people physically coming there anymore to investigate war crimes. The Prosecutor General's Office of Ukraine maintains a very, very large website for the submission of war crimes. And there are a number of organizations that use uh, incredible digital tools to geolocate and pinpoint. Um, as an example, a large part of war crime investigating in the Ukrainian conflict is Russian troop movements. I want you to know that many of the volunteers that do it remotely, they track Russian troop movements. And a lot of it is done through social media posts. We track the social media posts of Russian soldiers to prove that they were in these towns where the local residents say, this man matching this description, wearing this unit badge and uniform raped me and my daughter. And the Russians come back from their high command and say, oh, that's impossible. They weren't there. This is ludicrous. This is Nazi propaganda from Ukraine. And we have to go back against their rebuttal to the International Criminal Court inquiries and show proof through CC camera feed, through intercepts, through um, our very best tool is Russian social media. These are young men. They post all over social media. And we have, uh, I think the very first two convictions for war crimes in the theater of conflict were uh, Russian troops who posted their whereabouts or Instagram tags on people's walls and homes while they were occupying their homes. Um, you can easily verify that. If your daughter wants to get involved, all she has to do is go online. I'm happy to provide Sam with additional links for organizations that help with the investigation remotely. You do not yeah. have to go there. You do not have to get bombed. 
Your daughter can do this completely safely, and that's what we need. Digital detectives will be a huge help for the war effort. There's no reason to go there. That would be wonderful to get, to get as, as much information to her as I can about where to go and where to start and all that kind of thing. It's, she it's would my be pleasure. Very, she would be very IT savvy. She would be uh, a very good... Uh, and very good investigator. She is very analytical, mm -hmm. uh, due diligence mind. Tell her she's hired. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, Michael has his hand up as well, Tim. Um, so, uh, so, sorry, if I could say to you, Tim, could you yes, send Eilish. that information, please, to Sam? Thank you very much. I absolutely will. I talk to the man every day. It's a pleasure. Ailish, uh, bless you for being a poet. You definitely have a poet's soul, and I'm sure your daughter does too. Uh, Proud of you for participating and helping. Michael, talk to me. What can I do for you? Well, you know, her daughter works for Booz Allen in Virginia, so she's half <laughs> a spy already. Yep, um, yep. I, want, I wanted to alert you. First of all, thank you for your service. Uh, George Becker is on this call. He's uh, confined to uh, a wheelchair now as a result of serving Vietnam and getting the effects of uh, Agent Orange late in life. Uh, I served during Vietnam, but not in Vietnam, I was Air Force. Uh, here's my question. Uh, we all know that an eye for an eye leaves people blind. Amen. But I've, I keep waiting for more, hearing more reports of uh, terrorist acts happening, happening in Moscow or someplace. Uh, I don't want their schools and hospitals blown up like the Russians do in Ukraine. But on the other hand, I would really yes. like to see them suffer uh, have their people suffer in some way that they it comes to their attention that uh, uh, things aren't right. Uh, yeah. So what's what's going on? What 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 should happen there? Uh, this becomes a bigger talk about communism, my friend. Um, the new the only news source a lot of these people have is government state sponsored television. So, um, as far as terrorism acts of terrorism, I can tell you that while I was there the Ukrainians began cross-border attacks to cities that were uh, reachable on the other side of the border. Um, Belgorod in particular, uh, a lot of infrastructure there was destroyed. In fact, the Ukrainian counteroffensive is not just to reclaim territory in Ukraine. They are striking valid military targets as guided by United States and coalition intelligence um, in Russia. But here is the issue with making an international criminal court case, as I'm sure more of you know than me. When you make a, a court case, you have to be able to present it from a position of um, infallibility, meaning the Ukrainians can't be committing a lot of the same crimes as the Russians. And let me be honest with you, war crimes have been committed on both sides. However, the Ukrainians understand things happen in the heat of battle. These men are pushing invaders off their land and things have happened. Yes, sir. But they are looking, they are trying to look ahead, generations ahead to rebuilding their country. And they need this outcome of the International Criminal Court case. We cannot appear to have two bad guys fighting it out. So you cannot have, you, you have to have a white hat, black hat situation for the International Criminal Court to render a judgment. In law, we call that clean hands. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It absolutely is. And it, it is unfortunately not a situation of clean hands, but we are trying to minimize the situation here on the Ukrainian side. Many of these men, again, we've talked about standing your ground, and especially as native Floridians, someone comes into your home, you're not going to be happy about it. someone threatens and hurts your family. The the in, initial, you know, uh, drive is to hurt them back. Human nature. And this is in the worst of conditions in World War One trench fighting conditions uh, where I've been. So here's the good news. Uh, even in the far flung communities out in Siberia. Uh, people know and we see this through intercepts that um, Putin's government is turning on him. They can. It was easier in May and June for their government to turn a blind eye to a leader who has. Uh, here's a tidbit for you. Most of his conferences and everything else have been done from a bunker. This man knew from the start 
that things were turning and did not go to plan. He has spent the majority of the conflict in a bunker surrounded by guards. We know. And he knew that things were going to go poorly, but insisted on staying the course. And so many of the oligarchs and advisors, as you all know, have turned up mysteriously missing, dead, hung in their gardens, had an accident, fell out a window, magically drowned on their boat. Let's remember who we're dealing with. A, a, a man trained his entire life by the KGB. These are of, the hallmarks of, of what he does. Sam? No, I'll say that, that kind of goes to Bruce's question in the chat, which is, um, yeah. you know, maybe maybe to put a bow on this conversation from your perspective, what's the end game? What do you think the end game is here? You know, um, we're seeing the, we're going to find out what happens with the bombing uh, today, yes. tomorrow, in the next couple of days. We'll see you, what happens. Um, to, to finish very quickly with that question, you are going to see the Russian people rising up. They already are. People are getting killed with riot batons as we speak, primarily women, because so many of the men are gone. The Russian people can no longer accept a campaign of disinformation and accept it as truth. The, the numbers, the ghost towns do not lie. They do not lie. The Wagner group, who I unfortunately encountered in Africa, that's another story. Their shadowy network of mercenaries is recruiting people directly from prisons, commuting their sentences and saying, if you go to Ukraine, we'll let you live. The, my, my men right now are my men. Apologies. Uh, the Ukrainian men that I was lucky enough to serve and serve with are encountering men straight out of Russian prisons who were released to go fight as mercenaries in the conflict. So um, it is a wildly destabilizing situation. I've met and talked to many, many Russians that don't support the war, and things are crumbling back home. But that is our concern because, yes, Alana, you are absolutely right. Um, it is a very sketchy situation, but um, things in Russia are destabilized wildly, wildly at this point. And we expect them to continue destabilizing. But what does a wounded animal do, folks? It lashes out using any means at its disposal. And that is our fear. But I can tell you with every assurance that the United States intelligence community is well aware of this. Um, Bruce, let's move on to that. I see your question in chat. Um, any insight speculation as to the end game? Nuclear war is a final alternative. If he has nothing else to lose, if he feels that it is a valid tool, and that is, Sam, feel free to butt in here. Um, we we are in a situation where he's talking about annexing parts of Ukraine. Yes, absolutely, Ron, I am. Um, and from there, I'll be happy to speak to Rotary Clubs from Ukraine as I can. Um, we have to be careful here because if these portions of Ukraine are annexed, Russia is going to claim a legal situation where their actual physical land is being assaulted, not only by the Ukrainians, but by NATO. And that is what they want. We have feared from the start that we were drawn into this conflict, as the Russians knew that we could not stand idly by, to lure NATO into widespread confrontation with what Putin is trying to recreate as the old Soviet bloc. That is our concern, is that this was part of a long-term strategic plan of escalation, knowing that we as Americans would not stand idly by. We believe, many of us, I say we, many of us believe that that is absolutely the end game. Um, the, we, we know that Putin's dream, let's be honest here. We know that Putin's dream is to reunite the shattered states of the former, uh, Soviet union. It has been his dream and he has stated so for many years. He's making every attempt to do that. His mission before he dies is to restore, um, their nation to its former glory. He will stop at nothing to achieve that. And if he feels after annexation, which we cannot allow to happen. If he feels after annexation that we have attacked Soviet land, he will respond disproportionately, as we've seen. That is why I caution you, because we are moving into dangerous, frightening territory here. It's far from over. So if you ask why I'm going back, I think I made a pretty good case for that. I can't help as much as some people, but I will do everything that I am physically capable of doing to, to help them. Let's check chat real quick. I have a lot of direct messages from you folks. Um, Kimberly, you're absolutely right. 
the glory days of the Soviet. That's what Putin wants. You can ask me anything, folks. Again, I can't jeopardize my men, give operation specifics, but uh, I've still got time left. I know we're going to run over. It's 106 here. I'm happy to stay up and talk to you. I don't get any prettier. This is me. I apologize that I wasn't better looking, thinner. It is well, what it is. Well, here's here's what I would offer, uh, Tim. Please. Um, there, I'm, I'm so happy that we had some other Rotarians from around the state here. You know, I just want to make the call. You didn't ask for this. I'm doing this on my own here. Uh, yeah. I just want to let everybody know, you know, uh, Tim and his family, they've been in China for a long time. And, uh, you know, this is something that that he was passionate about. He told you why he's doing it. But uh, if you want to connect with him, you know, one of the one of the goals that I have is I want to get his message out. I, I really um, I'm just I'm just so, 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 so in awe of his of his passion and of what he's done. Stop it. So please Stop share it. this message, share the link, share the video, share his contact information. I want to make I want to make Tim uh, known for what he's doing uh, around the world, all that I can. So thank you, Tim. What I'll do uh, is I'll mute myself. And if we want to keep going, we can. Um, I'll just kind of I'll just kind of butt out if anybody wants to close it up. Uh, but I will call the the official meeting to a close. And by all means, if you want to stick around, Tim, I know it's 1 a.m. for you in China, but uh, if there are more questions, please take them. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Meeting adjourned. Back to you, Tim. Are you a pirate or a parrot head? Listen, you leave Jimmy Buffett out of this, okay? How dare you? Of course I'm a parrot head. I'm from Pensacola. How do you get raised in Pensacola? And and I've, Moore, I've, right? I've seen Buffett live in Boston. Come, come on, man. What kind of a question is that? I'm from Pensacola. <laughs> That's all. That's like, you know, East Pascagoula. <laughs> Pascagoula. My family, uh, interesting part of this. I had never met my father. I thought I was an only child my whole life. And I took a DNA test when I went to Ukraine because, well, everybody said, Tim, you're going to get blown up. And I said, well, I may as well give this a shot. I came back to the States, as Sam knows, and I found out that my entire family lives um, from between Pascagoula to New Orleans. My entire family is from uh, Mississippi and Louisiana, and I have a huge family. I have three brothers and a sister I never knew existed. So put yourself in their shoes. Suddenly they have a one-legged pirate parrot head brother who they met coming back from Ukraine. Um, their kids think I'm a real life pirate. And I basically sail a ship uh, marauding and pillaging up and down the coast at this point. And I, I break their hearts when I say I'm a special education teacher. It makes me kind of a pirate. My, my kids love that, but, you know, I, I've, I've had a blessed life, but I, I've been a pirate. And I, again, I had six pirate tattoos. Look, 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 look at the camera. Hello. Look, look at my arm. I, I, I have a pirate brand. What, what did you expect? You know where I'm from. I'm, I'm a Florida man. What do you think you were getting? Somebody who was squeaky clean? I had a mullet until I was 30. Come on. I'm from the panhandle. Next question. Move on. So, so I have, so I, I'm pretty sure I know what you're going to say, but what mm. do you, what do you think of the sham election? Oh, wait, I, I prejudiced your answer. Uh, <laughs> the sham election yesterday where people were forced to vote at gunpoint. Uh, we knew it was coming. The referendum. Yeah. The referendum. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, um, the city where I was at uh, initially in Ukraine is a city famous for partisan partisans sabotage. And, you know, the Poles have a special talent for those sorts of things. The Polish um, I met so many Poles that were lining up at the border to go conduct uh, guerrilla attacks on uh, Russian, particularly voting and polling stations. So any forced referendums will be met with Molotov cocktails. I, yeah. I assure you, there is no better way to mobilize a populace than sham elections, sham leadership. The Ukrainians are a God-fearing, incredible people, but, but they have a very, very, very long memory, and they fight like wild animals, like no one I've ever seen in my life. You do not want to tangle with these people. And all they're doing is angering. They, they are, the Russians are creating insurgents. Okay. They are, all they are doing is encouraging more and more people to take up arms. It is literally one of the worst decisions tactically that they've ever made. It's like going into a village 
and shooting a couple of people and leaving and wondering why that village suddenly has Taliban sympathizers in Afghanistan. They are creating a greater insurgency. I, I saw, I, I met child soldiers uh, there. Um, well, I mean, I'm I, at 47. I consider an 18 year old, a child soldier. I'm old. You know, I feel old. Oh, Again, I'm held together with duct tape. But um, it's the worst decision they could have made. It was a joke. It was a sham. But all it's going to do is have a destabilizing uh, effect on their local governments, their puppet governments. Uh, Jennifer, it was my pleasure. The world does need more one-legged pirate parrot heads like me. Um, I'm coming back home to the States, back to Florida. I don't know what I'm going to do. Hopefully, I can teach or do corporate training somewhere. But um, this is a time where God-fearing people like me that have lived overseas for a long time feel the call to come home. I'm not going to get started on the issues that we're having domestically, folks. That's another call. But I feel the call to go home. Thank you, Dave. So you folks will be seeing me within the next year or so, um, maybe doing speaking engagements. I don't know. I'm really a walking sign that says, don't do what I did. You know, when you're a one-legged man, all you're really good for in a lot of cases is telling people when it's slippery outside or the shortest distance to walk between two points. It's like asking a one man, a one tooth man for tips on dental care. What's he going to talk to you about taffy? You know, I, I have a very limited field of expertise and most of it is trying not to fall down. Very good question. It was a terrible idea and it's just going to end up in more dead Russians. Next question. I would just like to say to you, Tim, uh, Thank you so very much. It's all been really, really pleasure. incredibly interesting. Uh, but a man is as old as the woman he hugs. Oh, dear Lord. So just hey, remember you, that. You are absolutely just, right. Just remember that. Your wife, your wife <laughs> deserves a young, virile man like you. So as my late Irish mother would say, would you quit it? <laughs> I don't know about young. I certainly don't know about virile, but I know that she can hear me coming from a while away because my leg makes noise. So I never surprise her anymore. She also said that me losing my leg was the best thing that ever happened to our marriage because um, she says now I can't argue with her. She told me not to go and end up losing my leg and I didn't listen to her. So she says the next time I argue with her, they'll cut off my head. So it's actually ruined my marriage because I can't argue with the woman now. <laughs> It's, it's the worst marriage. Does anyone know a good Rotarian uh, attorney for divorce? My marriage has been ruined by the loss of my leg. The other Here's thing I was going to say yes. to you, Tim, be, just before I forget, I need to say Please. this. When you come back or when you're there, if you would like to join our club as a member, you would be incredibly welcome. Of course I'm going to join. Are you kidding me? Really? You've no, got I'm not Sam. Kidding. No, I know. He's wonderful. But I follow Sam all over the world. You. Okay. <laughs> I, would, I would be absolutely honored. My grandfather was a Rotarian. My grandfather was active with the Lions Club, and uh, he was the best part of us and the glue mm -hmm. that held my family together. Um, so well, that, that honor. We'll talk further. I'll make sure you all have my contact right. information. Email me. I would say email me instead of Twitter. My Twitter is right. ridiculous. It's got yeah. far too many people. Uh, I'm happy with Sam giving out my direct email address. Okay. Just talk to me one-on-one. -on -one. Th that mm -hmm. Twitter is largely there for me to coordinate donations for my men, to coordinate humanitarian relief. I don't use it much when I'm outside of Ukraine. And when I'm there, I use it to bring up awareness of the equipment situation. You know, we've vastly helped Ukraine, but a lot of that equipment does not trickle down. Same for those of you veterans, and thank you for your service. You understand our troops in reserve, our reservists, our, our National Guardsmen, rarely get the best of the equipment that goes to the army that goes to places like Bragg to the airborne Corps and other units. It's the same situation in Ukraine. A lot of the equipment that's gone, a lot of the funding goes to more crucial top tier units. And a lot of the men that are actually out there on the ground fighting in this trench warfare are territorial or the TDF territorial defense forces. Um, Sam has a picture of me holding an assault rifle from 1918 a squad automatic weapon from 1918 uh, in a Ukrainian army and cleaning it because they had just fought with it that week using a 100 plus year old weapon. And that is common for these men. One of my Ukrainian soldiers said to me again, my, they're not mine said to me, uh, captain Mitchell, how did, how do you expect us to fight? 
all we have are sticks and rocks in some cases. Our guns don't even work. And it made me want to weep. So again, that's what my Twitter is for. I try to get these men help. Another tidbit for you folks before I finish. Fanola, sorry, you have to go. Enjoy the music class. Some Ukrainian units have to depend upon the black market sale of arms and uh, personal protective equipment to protect their men. Um, they have to source these things any way they can. I can hear. Vanola? That's Vanola. Yeah, Vanola. You're not on mute anymore, love. <laughs> Don't touch it. You're on mute now. Don't touch it. Okay. <clears throat> Very good. Who's up next? Hit me with something. I'm here. I've got a few minutes left. Talk to me. You have the chance to talk to a real life pirate. I know some of you are historians. When are you going to get this chance again? Well, when are you going to? Uh, uh, what I'd like to know uh, is when are you going to fight this 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 um, six six week long divorce case as a pirate? <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm thinking of the two actors, whatever their names was. I can't remember their names. Johnny today. Depp. There you Johnny go. Johnny Depp. I, Poor I, Johnny I, Depp. I, I couldn't even remember their darn names. God. That's the problem is I'm what real pirates look like, not Johnny Depp. I'm sorry That's if you were right. expecting Johnny Depp. <laughs> I am covered in tattoos head to toe. Um, I found I got a I got a full chest Ukrainian uh, tattoo of St. Javelin, if you know what St. Javelin is before I went. And the day that I arrived there, I found out that if I was captured, the Russians would execute me on site because I had a Ukrainian military tattoo. Oh, so Mary, that was a fun fact. And I can't run fast. So my options were limited. I didn't have much of a choice. I'm easy to, all you got to do is trip me guys. You know, I'm easy <laughs> to take out. Right. Right. No, well, just stay safe. That's I will. Absolutely. You as well. We will talk safe. again. Safe. Who's next? Talk to a living pirate. I'm here taking your calls. <laughs> Sam made me the host since he had to drop. He said he had to go to a meeting. Any other questions or conversation for Tim? If you have nothing else, I will go to bed. Go to bed. Mr. 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 Potato Head has to get up early. I have to go sleep on my giant pillow. And, and, and Tim, uh, I, I appreciate you wearing a tie. None of us do that anymore. In fact, thanks so again for showing up, Tim. Appreciate it. Uh, let me let me explain why I'm wearing a tie. OK, yeah, because if I don't, I look like I'm trying to rob your house. Your house. All right. So <laughs> well, what else would I expect from a pirate? Oh, there you go. You are. You I are have to wear smooth. a tie or I really do look like a stinking pirate. OK, <laughs> if I need to go over to the shelf over here and put the pirate hat on, you have to admit something before I go. I have the world's best Halloween costume. I can be a flamingo. I can be the lamp from a Christmas story. I can be a pirate. I come equipped. You can't say that I don't get into the spirit of Halloween. Amazing pirate costume. Really realistic. And we could call you from the, what was the 1950s? Hop along Cassidy. See, hop see, along, hop along <laughs> fall a lot, stumpy. I have nicknames. <laughs> it was absolutely my pleasure, guys. I'm going to go to bed. Thank you, so much. Thank you for all I'm going to get up early in the morning and uh, try to take care of some special education students, a, get some lesson get plans in place. Before I go back to the land of borscht and vodka, way too much vodka. Oh, those Ukrainians. My Lord. Yeah. I'm used to hurricanes, like, like actual hurricanes and hurricane the drink. Oh, they have a special game they play, which is um, convince the American that we do 40 toasts every meal. Oh, yeah. they they were mean to me. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure you're such cruelty. Your liver, your liver is Susie. Fresh. It was my pleasure, George thank Ailish. You. My pleasure to meet I'm everybody. Sure I'm sure thank you'll be you. hearing from lots of us. So thanks. Well, for I'm me. happy to do another call with you folks. Also, I'll talk to other clubs. I have oh. a unique story and a crazy life. We can talk about other things. I've like had a crazy the Wagner, the Wagner group too. What you were talking about? Oh. There were several things you said. That's another story. That's another story. I'm like, wait, wait, what? We got. Well, I got to get you on the hook, right? I don't make money off this. I got to get you on the hook for the next one. The Wagner group, Africa, book this crazy pirate again. Yes, let's That's see how it. I get you. You got to be careful. I'm like a fungus. I grow on you. <laughs> you have already. Watch out. Thanks. All right, much. folks. I'm it's going to bed. To it was my Thanks pleasure. Again. All right. I'm going to so close much. the meeting, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.